Hey guys, how's it going? Greg from Tales from the Pythian here. I'm back with the part two of Found Ever and Below the Shattered Obelisk's prep of Fandolin and the Red Brand Hideout. Um, last week I did part one and we kind of touched on um, item piles amongst active tiles work and we were looking predominantly um, inside of Fandolin and then I think we did the first four rooms of um, the hideout. So we're going to look at one thing in Fandolin today, and then we're going to look in completing the Red Brand hideout. I did a little bit of pre-prep work to kind of make things run smooth and probably go a little faster. So hopefully we can keep this video a little bit shorter. So anyway, let's get started. So um, right now I'm in the scene that's going to be the Smithy. Uh, again, this is a, a Bailey Wiki scene of the town. And um, we made a Smith here, Krorzog, the half-orc. And what we want to do is we want to set up his items. So we're using item piles and we have this set up as a merchant, right? So it is enabled as an item pile and under other settings, it is a merchant. So let's talk about populating the items. You can manually do it. Like we talked about last, last week, we can drag and we can drop and everything will just populate, but we can also use a table to do it, right? So if I told it that I wanted to use this Oakhurst blacksmith table and I add the table, okay, then it's going to stick that table into the usable roll tables of this particular merchant. I'm going to go in here to my configure table. I'm just going to drop this down and make it general. I'm going to tell it I want it to add all the items to roll from, right? And then you can see if I scroll to the bottom, it says, you know, click roll to start. So we'll come up here and we'll do just that. We'll roll the table. Whoops. Whoops. My fault on closing it. But when we look down here after I rolled the table, you see everything that was in the table with the rolls. And then we see everything as it was rolled. So up at the top, if we found arrows, let's see if we can find them at a scan uh, really quickly. Uh, arrows, 1d4. And these are in lots of 20, right? So here we have arrows and there's 20. So it rolled a, it rolled a one, right? Um, and then of course we have all the pricing that goes with everything all the way through. So I can just tell it to add all of the items. And now all of these items with their quantities are added to my store. Just like that. Bingo. Everything's priced appropriately. Um, that, like I mentioned last week, I have that set up in the compendium. Um, I use D and D beyond and it brings everything standard over with the cost already in it. And then in the event of using uh, magic items, I use a, an online resource to find the, the price of magic items. And I usually just put those into that compendium and, um, and roll with it. But anyway, this is setting up a merchant using item piles with a roll table. And that's uh, going to be Krorzog, who's not in the book. He's just my blacksmith and Fandlin. Okay. So let's go over to the red brand hideout and start working through um, completing, um, I think we stopped with R5. So let's pop the journal open. Bum bum. <clears throat> Trouble in Fandlin. Red Brand's hideout. R5, the holding cells. All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so in this one, we have some locked cell doors. So we can see that the cell doors are locked. And um, We've got three captives, a human commoner, uh, Myrna Dendrar, and um, her two children, a 13-year-old Nars and 18-year-old Nilsa. So we created those NPCs. Um, I put them into Fandelver and below NPCs, Fandolin. I left them under commoners. Okay. So we have Myrna. So we'll drop her in. We have Nars, and we'll put his sister over here, Nilsa, with him. And then I'm just going to take his token and I'm going to go to the appearance and I'm going to drop the size to about 0.6 just to give him more of an appearance of being a, being a child there. Okay. And then here, I believe we also are going to have, um, four, three, three red brand ruffians. So again, we can just come over into, um, into our list of monsters and NPCs. And here we have the red brand ruffians. I haven't done any um, 
images for these guys yet. I'm sure I'll get around to it. Okay. So this is an easy room to set up. The only thing that is uh, beyond setting up an NPC and creating images for them, if you go that far or whatever, is dealing with the locked doors inside of the VTT if you want to do it in, with any sort of automation. So um, in this particular instance, I do. And what I'm doing is I'm using a module called Lock and Key. Um, and so I have these set up to work with lock and key and we'll look at that real quick. So I'm gonna to go to my wall controls layer and then I'm just gonna click on um, the door and we're gonna go, we'll take a look at it. So it's a door and it's locked, that's it, simple. So you'll notice I have this tab right here. This is the lock and key tab. So if I click it, um, I'll just quickly run down through the way I have this particular thing set up. So one, it is lockable. Yes, it is a lockable object. Uh, does it lock on close automatically? No. What is the key that will open the door? So this is the ID of the key that's gonna open up the door. It is RB cell for red brand, right? So RB cell is the key, which I have created over here in the items under keys in chapter two. I have the red brand cell key right here, right? And it is ready to go, okay? Um, no passwords on the door, nothing like that. So what's the difficulty for picking the lock? Well, it's a, it's a DC 10 to pick the lock. So if they don't have the key and they wanna try to pick the lock, they're gonna roll a DC 10. If they don't have lock picks and they don't have the key and they wanna try to break the lock, that lock break DC is gonna be a 22. And I really haven't changed anything else, right? I gave them three attempts to pick the lock because, you know, if you sit there and you do it all day until you succeed, what's what's the point? All right, so that's the, the door set up right there. So with lock and key, it gives you the options for the lock picking to name the item. And it says names or compendium IDs, which is the recommended way of doing things of a lock picking item with a dash if no item is necessary to pick the lock. So if I put just a dash in here, um, anybody could pick the lock without any type of a tool. I'm just using the standard thieves tools from fifth edition. Um, and I chose to go with the name as opposed to the compendium ID. Uh, I couldn't tell you why, but that's just how I, I went with it and, it and it works fine. So if anything, it goes sideways with that, I'll let you guys know. Um, but that's how the lock picking works. So it's gonna to look to see if the player that's trying to pick the lock has thieves tools or not. And then if they do, it is gonna be a 1d20 plus the dex mod plus any um, their thieves tools proficiency uh, plus any bonus they get for that, right? So it's gonna basically per the D&D 5e rules. Same with the breaking of the lock formula. It's gonna be a d20 plus their strength modifier, uh, plus any skills of athletics proficiency that they have to be able to break the lock, right? And in here you can set default DCs, but as you can tell on the door, we're able to override those, right? So that's how that would work. So if I put a player in here, let's see, let's go with um, Cade, because he is a rogue and he indeed in his inventory has thieves tools right here right so he's prepared to pick the lock so we brought Cade on here so um if we click on the door we're looking in the player version now so if we click on the door it tells us the door is locked right if i now shift and click on the door oh, game is paused <laughs> So that's on the DM to unpause the game. There we go, let's bring him back in. So if I uh, shift and right click on the door, it rolls and it said that he succeeded at picking the lock. So if I reduce this and we go look on the DM side, it shows me that he tried to pick a lock and he rolled the D20, he had an eight, he gets a plus eight. So he got a 16 and he succeeded at picking the lock with the thieves tools. So let's jump back to the player version. You can see that the door now works for him, right? So 
if I were to relock that door back on the DM side, and let's rejoin Kate over here. Actually, I'm gonna to go to the DM side to do this. Let's uh, look back into Cade's inventory and let's delete his thieves, his thieves tools from him. Okay. So then if we come back over to the player view and he tries to pick the lock, he has no lock pick in his inventory, right? If he right clicks on the lock, he doesn't have a key in his inventory. So he would have to try to break the lock with the alt right click. And he failed to break the lock because he rolled a D20 and he got a 19 in the DC to break that lock per the book is a 22. So let's see what happens if we put the key into Cade's inventory, right? So we'll come back to the DM side. We'll grab that red brand cell key. Whoops. Pop him open. Let's drop the key on him. And let's come back over here. So now if I just right click on this door with him having the key in his inventory, the door is now unlocked, right? So what that is doing, let's go back over. We'll just walk through it um, real quick. All that it is doing is exactly what we told it, right? We're saying if he's got a key that's got this, this, um, this tag to it, this ID, then he can un he can unlock the door. If he doesn't, he's got to pick it, which we saw him do, and he was successfully picked it because it's a pretty low DC. Um, if he did not have that, he could not break it because he rolled a 19, which is an exceptionally high roll on a D20, but he has no pluses to assist him, so he'll never roll a 21 or a 22. So that was just that, and he cannot break the lock. So this is a cool way to be able to, um, you know, play with locked doors and use lock picks and have those sorts of things actually apply as your players are kind of moving through a space. So, you know, definitely beyond theater of the mind, which is cool. Um, at the same time, not to replace theater of the mind, but a combination of the two definitely uh, makes things fun and interesting. So let's get rid of Kate off of here and we can call R5 uh, pretty much set up, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so we're going to look at R6 now, which is going to be the armory, which is right here. So this one's pretty easy. This is also going to be using item piles. So we'll go over to our actors. I try to pre-create some uh, things to help us out. <clears throat> um, let's see. Where did I put them? Item piles. Here we go. Red brand hideout. All right. So in here, we're going to have a weapon rack. So I went ahead and made a weapon rack. So we'll just pull that in. And then once we have it in, we're going to size it up, right? And kind of put it where we want it and rotate it around. Yeah, I think, uh, I think maybe we put it on the south wall. We'll put this one on the south wall right over top of this guy. Perfect. That looks pretty good. <clears throat> and then all we do is we pop it open, right? And we're going to populate it. So. Before I populate it, I just want to make sure I check a couple things under other settings. I will make it a container. Um, I'm not going to put any images on it because I want it to look like the weapon rack. And under the main settings, I'm just going to make sure that it does not delete when it's empty. I want that weapon rack to remain in place. And all my sharing settings should already be set up by default. Okay, and so this makes it easy. We have 12 spears, so look at this. We can just grab these spears and drop it in here, and we have 12, right? That's great. And then six short swords, we'll drop them in here, six. And then four long swords, drop them in here. Oops, there we go, four, right? And we'll just repeat this process, six light crossbows until we get them all in here, which is pretty quick, right? It doesn't, it doesn't take long. Uh, did I drop the bolts in? There's the quivers. Oh, the daggers. We have, uh, oh, look at that. Must be a misassociation. Look at that. The crossbow bolts go to daggers. So that's something I've got to fix and adjust, right? So let's just fix it right now. Um, not this part of it, but let's get what we really need. So we'll grab our items. And we'll just search out crossbow bolts um, and find them. 
probably just going to be called bolts. There we go. Crossbow bolts. We'll drop those in here. We'll change the dagger to zero, which will eliminate it. And then the crossbow bolts, we're going to have, <clears throat> I think I said 120, update the pile, and then we can leave. And now, anytime the players click on this, all this is going to be there, right? Um, so let's hit the storeroom. <clears throat> so the storeroom, it just has, um, it has 40 beaver pelts worth two gold pieces each, right? So in this case, I just have a crate. Right, so we'll drag the crate in, we'll open it up, we'll just check it. It is enabled, it is a container, uh, it will not delete when it is empty, we'll update it, and then it's got the beaver pelts which I created. They're worth uh, two gold pieces a piece. There's 40 of them, right? So two gold pieces a piece. It's ready for market. Good to go. All right, so R8. Pop my journal back open. I tend to close it inadvertently um, a lot. All right, so we have a couple things that we need to worry about, right? So the Nothic we'll put in here, you know, right prior to the game. Um, there's not really anything that you need to know special about the Nothic other than its name and the, you know, it's, it's behavior. Uh, it has a treasure chest and then we have a, uh, bridge that's trapped. And then we have, uh, dead goblins that are underneath the bridge. And we have the body of Myrna, who is the woman in the cells over here. The body of her husband is down at the bottom of this pit and been picked clean by, uh, Saranac. Okay, so the treasure hoard um, is in a battered wooden chest in a cubby hole at the bottom of the crevasse under the northern bridge. Okay, so we will pop back over here and we will find a chest. We'll just pull the chest in, right? Let's pop it open. Let's just make sure that it is a container. So here I am going to set up the paths, right? So it is going to be closed. It's not going to be locked. So let's go find the closed image. Okay, so I'm just gonna go to my shared tiles folder and search out chest and take a peek um, at the images. So I like to use this guy. So there I am closed. And then I'm gonna do the same thing, chest. And here I am open. And then here I am empty. So we'll pop all three of these in here. Right, so we have open, closed, empty. Don't need anything for locked. Uh, closing sound path, what I like to do is go to the core data of Foundry, go to the sounds, go to the doors, go to the wood, and then I like to use the uh, heavy sound for the closing and the heavy sound for the opening. And then um, for the locked, I use the test, right? And that's that, right? Should be good to go. Um, it does not delete when empty. We update that. And then all we have to do is fill it with things. So we're going to add the currency and it says that it has 160 silver pieces in it. It has 120 gold pieces in it. Uh, five Malachite gems worth 12 gold each. So let's just spread this stuff out for a minute. Move it around. Come and pop our uh, items back open here. And let's see what our Malachite, if I can spell, we'll get there. All right, so the Malachite is worth 10 gold pieces. So you know what, we won't adjust it. The difference between 10 and 12 is not significant enough to really do anything, is in, in my opinion. So I'm just going to drag the... Um, Malachite in after I submit that we'll drag the Malachite in and we're gonna have what did it say it said five of those done um, and then we have a potion of healing so if we just type in healing potion of healing done and then a potion of climbing so we do potion of climbing and potion of growth 
here we go. All right, so that's uh, and a plus one longsword, which plus one longsword is actually a named longsword. Um, so I'll probably I'll probably do a little bit more work to this than just adding a plus one longsword. But for now, we'll just add the plus one longsword so that we have it in there. So we'll move this out of the way. We'll update the item pile. And then I'm just going to make this thing smaller because it says it's a small battered chest. Also, I want it to look like it's down below, right? So we'll just set it somewhere down here, kind of out of the way. And you know what? Let's just, um, let's be a little fun with it and let's see if we can adjust the opacity just a smidge just to make it maybe a little bit more, just to make it a little bit more obscure. Let's see, let me go to 60. And let's see. Yeah, that's just, just, just a little bit more obscure, but not enough where they won't find it. And it looks like it's set down below the bridge and we're good to go, in my opinion. So I uh, will update that pile, we'll leave, and it's good to go. So the other thing that's going on in here is that we have a bridge. <clears throat> the southern bridge is trapped. Any creature that weighs 50 pounds or more to move across it is going to collapse the bridge, right? So how am I going to deal with that? Uh, so I have a token, and I'm going to talk about how I made this guy. Or a tile, rather. So this is a tile, right? It's a tile. So my map has the bridges, like the map was built with the bridges in it, so it's 2D flat. I can't change anything about that, right? So how, how do I make this work? So after thinking about it, I decided uh, I'll keep it simple, and I just basically did a screenshot of the chasm here where I caught both sides of the rock and made sure I had the middle. Um, I took it into Pixlr, and I kind of tried to get the color to match from the screenshot as best I could and this is what I got so you know you scroll in you can definitely see it you know but you scroll out and it's not so bad the important thing to remember here is that in the moment they're probably not going to notice immediately anyway because they're going to see this thing hidden they're not going to see it so in the player view this bridge is going to look just like this bridge okay so what we're doing now is we're going to set up monks active tiles to make this become um, a trap so this will be pretty pretty straightforward. So we'll go to our triggers. It'll be uh, definitely active, controlled by anyone, and we want it to be an on enter um, trigger. So we'll then go to our actions. And for our actions, the first thing that we want it to do is we want it to uh, show hide, right? So we will find our show hide. Um, we will use just this tile and we will show it. So that will make it look as if the bridge collapses and the players that are on it or the player that triggers it will fall and they're going to take the 2d6 um, damage from from falling. OK, so we're going to first show the tile. Um, and then we're going to do a hurt heal. <clears throat> so there's better ways probably to do like you can do um, so during hurt heal, you can do an attack. Um, if you have like uh, objects built up that you can use for attacks, right? So you could use like, a, I don't know, bridge trap does the attack against the player for a specific amount of damage that is of type bludgeoning. If you, you know, that sort of thing, you can totally do that sort of thing. So um, we're just going to do the hurt heal here. Keep it, keep it straightforward and simple. So we're going to hurt the triggering player and we're going to hurt them by uh, rolling 2d6 and then they're gonna fall you know the 10 feet we're going to add a chat uh, message and we will do a public roll and we will show the dice so that will happen and then you could do anything else that you wanted to do here right at that point um, it is important to remember that at the bottom of the chasm is difficult terrain. So once the players get down there, uh, their speed is going to be affected. And of course, they'll have to make any roll to climb back up. Of course, they probably won't have to worry about that because they'll have party members with them that will throw the rope down and, and save them back up. So it's very simple, right? Very simple trap. 
Um, we're going to show the tile and roll the damage. Um, the weight being 50 pounds or more that move across it, that requirement is met by all my players, so I don't feel a need to do anything more complicated. And it's just a really good demonstration of how um, simple you can make a trap, right? So as an example, let's go grab one of the players. Let's grab Sir Norak. He's got more hit points. He might maybe survive it. So boom, there he goes. He took seven points of damage. We see that the tile became visible. It looks okay, right? It's not perfect, but it's okay. And um, it kind of gets the point across and it, and it creates the effect um, without, uh, without giving it away, if you will, right? So let me give him his seven back and let's get him gone. And then let's go back to our tile layer. That's all we gotta do is rehide that, it's good to go. And that's it. Uh, we have our chest, we have our trap bridge, and that is our crevice, crevasse, crevase. It's all, it's all good to go. So then we'll go to the common room. In the common room right here, they are going to be playing um, some dice games and they're basically they're gambling. So it says that all the treasure in the room is on the table. So again, if we go back to our to our item piles, I have a um, I have a coin pile. So we can just bring that coin pile in, drop it right there in the middle of the table. We we'll click on it. Um, we'll just check it. So this is enabled. This is actually a pile. So back at the main settings, yes, I want that to delete when it's empty. So I'm going to update it, and then we're going to add the currency, and we're going to have. Uh, 75 copper pieces. We're going to have 55 silver pieces. We're going to have 22 electrium pieces. And we're going to have 15 gold pieces. All right. And a gold earring set with tiny ruby worth 30 gold pieces. Update it and leave. And then bam, we're good here. Now we have this coin pile on the table. And when they click on it, they have everything, you know, they can pick it up. All right, R11, Wizard's Workshop. So this one was a fun one to do. So um, in here is a closet who's invisible who can communicate with uh, Glass Staff because it's his familiar and they can do that mentally without having to speak. So obviously if the players come in this door, the closet's going to tell glass staff the players are there and he's going to boogie out which we'll come back to in just a minute okay um meanwhile he's going to wait for an opportunity to be just an absolute menace right he's going to sneak around and um try to be nefarious not put himself in any danger but do the most damage to the weakest player that he can or delay them in going after glass staff that's what his purpose is so let's say they deal with him great they search around this room what are they going to find um, well, they're going to find this alchemist supplies and they can tell that it's set up to brew a potion of visibility and that's all theater of the mind. That's wonderful. Um, and then there's also a book that is a tome written in Dwarvish. So again, I'm going to use item piles, polyglot, and the journals for this, right? So first off, let's pull the book in and we're going to put the book on the table, right? So put the book, say, right to here. Let's rotate it. And let's um let's shrink it down just a smidge. There we go. We'll put that thing. Put it right, right there, just like that. Okay. And then we're gonna pop it open. And up here I have Ermon's journal as an item. Okay. So it is just an item. It's got the same book on it, right? And then in the description we have a journal entry link. So the way this will work is. We will just close this. We'll drag the journal entry in, or the item, the actual journal in, update the pile, and then we'll leave it. Okay, so if the players find the book, or you know, they're gonna click on the pile, then there's the journal. So let's adjust this pile. This is a pile, and we want it to delete when it's empty. So when they pick the book up, the book will no longer be on the table. Pretty straightforward, right? So if they pick up the journal and they open it, then they can click on journal entry 
and it just says Ermon's journal amongst various entries regarding the travels and adventures of a dwarf called Ermon you find two pages that have been marked for reference they go to the first one so you're going to notice that this is all highlighted in yellow <clears throat> if I leave my cursor be you're gonna see it tooltips me that it's in dwarvish so how do we do that well first of all you have to be using polyglot which is a module I'll link that below and then the next thing you have to do is you have to change your sheet type to tiny MCE. It doesn't work with the pros, um, pros mirror sheet. You have to switch it back to tiny MCE to get this functionality. And then what will happen is when you drop down um, your options for your journal down at the bottom, you'll have polyglot and you'll have all of the languages set up that you use in your in your game, right? So here we have, this will be in Dwarvish. And the way this will work is if a player has Dwarvish or knows Dwarvish, it's on their character sheet, then they will be able to read this journal. If they don't, it will look completely different. And we'll try to demonstrate that um, with the character being open here. I'll, uh, I'll pull somebody over into this room and we'll get them to open up the journal and um, let's, I hopefully have a player that does not speak Dwarvish. Uh, anyway. Uh, that's how this works so we have this page and we're instructed by the module to put the first two paragraphs of the source book in here that explains what's kind of been going on like the background the very short background of wave echo cave and fandover and the fandover pact so that's this um then it also mentions making a reference to a mace uh, that was commissioned by followers of lefander to be created in the um in wave echo cave uh using the forge all right so that's what this is all set up to do so let's see what we have for player languages because i'm not sure let's see what donnie knows language wise uh goblin so he does not know he does not know dwarvish let's see cade uh does not know dwarvish sir norak does all right so we're going to do an experiment here we will close this out. We will update that pile. We will bring in Sir Norak who does. We'll bring in Donnie who does not, right? And then I will log in over here with Donnie. So, all right, here we go. So we've got him in. So Donnie's in, Donnie's going to there we go. Now let's let's give this a go. So he's going to take a peek here. All right. Yes. Yeah, so this one is not in Dwarvish, but when he goes to the mark page, this is what it looks like. And he doesn't know. Notice the tooltip for him. The tooltip for him doesn't tell him it's Dwarvish. It's just in the text of the, of Dwarven. Right. Same with this one. That's it. So he just knows that amongst this journal's various entries are two mark pages. Pretty cool. Now, on the other hand, if we do this with Sir Norak, check out the journal, Herman's journal. Now, if we go to the mark page for him, look at that. He can read it and he knows it's Dwarvish. It's pretty cool. I mean, that's pretty cool stuff, right? So it makes them kind of spread. Language is so underused, I feel like, um, especially when you get into the VTT world. It's like, I don't know Dwarvish, man. It's hard for me to do anything. So using a module like Polyglot to be able to use it in journals and to be able to use it, you know, down here with the languages that you speak, I think is pretty cool. But uh, anyway, let's get this out of here. We don't need this anymore. It's gone. Let's get my wonderful volunteers out of here. And I think for 11... It was the journal and treasure. There is, um, there are some ingredients. There's mercury, dragon bile, and powdered nightshade, uh, which you know can be dropped around the room as flasks or whatever. All right. So last but not least, uh, we have R12, which is where glass staff is at. So in here, as far as setup goes, we have the hidden door. We have um, a chest that can have two different conditions when found, either either not being surprised, right? So let's say that the players enter, enter in this way, 
Um, he's not surprised. He got word from the closet and he took off. He's gone. If he was surprised, the players find the secret door over here and they come in this way. And there, there is more in the chest that's in the room than what would be if he was not surprised, which really boils down to some, some scrolls, right? It either has scrolls or it does not have scrolls. So to deal with that, um, again, I kind of thought about it for a little bit and what I came up with that we're going to try, and this might or might not work, but we're going to try. So I created Yarno's chest altered. I'm sorry, alerted, altered. <laughs> and Yarno's chest surprised. Okay. So in the surprised version, we're going to make sure that it is a container. It is, we have everything set up. So hopefully that's all going to stick and we want it to not go away when we are done with it. So we'll update it. And then if he is, um, if he is surprised, then inside of the chest, there is 180 silver pieces. So 180 silver, 130 gold, and a silk pouch with five carnelians worth 10 gold pieces each. So we will pop open our items and we will attempt hard to spell carnelians. There's one that's worth 50. These are worth 10. So we'll just import that in and we will make it worth 10 and be done with it. We'll close that, submit our turns, and then we got our carnelians. There's five of them, right? And two peridots. Peridots, and they are worth uh, 15 each. So these are 500. So again, we just import it and we come in here and we change it to 15. Pretty, pretty easy stuff. And we'll drag that in and drop it. Uh, two pair dots, two. All right, two scrolls that Glass Staff brought with him from Neverwinter. A spell scroll of Hold Person and a spell scroll of Fireball. All right, if he is surprised, however, uh, they are there, right? So we'll put Hold Person and we'll put Fireball. Okay, there we go. Um, and they will remain. So we're going to update that item, item pile and we're going to leave for a moment. Okay. So if we go back, uh, the one where he's alerted, we're going to come back in here. We're going to add those 180 silver. We're going to add those 130 gold. We're going to, um, submit that. We're going to add the carnelians. There are five of those, right? And then there are Parado, which are paradox are two of those. And that's going to be it because it says that if he is um, alerted, he grabs the uh, scrolls from the chest and he flees out the secret door and he heads to go get the waterproof sack that's submerged in the fountain. That's, that's his, that's his MO, right? So we just will update that. Okay. So those are the two chests. So then what I've done here is I've made a tile that's going to be invisible. And the tile has this tag, Iarno's chest. Okay. Iarno's chest. So we're going to use monks active tiles to create two buttons. We're going to call one button alerted. We're going to call one button surprised, right? So I made those buttons already. Um, I used Pixlr to make them. So let me get back to the root here. Let's go to map buttons. So we have alerted and we have surprised. Okay. And this is what we're going to use. And we'll just stick these up high and we'll end up turning them invisible. Um, you know, if we need to, I'm just gonna make this small for a minute, slide this to the side. We shouldn't need this anymore. So the alerted button, under our triggers, we're going to make this 
a click. So on click by the game master only. Let's do a double click just because sometimes I accidentally click places. So the GM only on a double click. And then our actions are going to be that we are going to create a token that is, um, and we're going to select it. So we're doing alerted. So we're going to select the alerted chest and we're going to use the tagger function for the coordinates. So we're going to say we want it to put it on the tile that's tagged our year nose chest. It's going to match every term and it's going to be in the active scene, which will be, which will be this scene. We want it in the greater insurance policy. We could scroll down here and make it very specific. We want it to be uh, this scene, but we're just going to do the active scene. And we're going to tell it to snap to grid and it doesn't need to avoid any other tokens because it's just going to be a click of a button. And then we're going to, we're going to update it. Okay. And that is pretty much going to be that. So we apply and we close and then the surprise one is going to be the same way. We're going to go to our triggers. We're going to do a double click game master only, right? And then under our actions, we're going to do a create token. And this time we're going to pick the surprise chest and the coordinates are going to be the tagger, Iarno's chest, the active scene, snap to grid, good to go, apply, update, done, right? And so whenever, whatever happens, if the players are coming this way, I can say, uh, he's surprised and boom, this chest is going to appear. And if I open up the chest, they're the spell scrolls, right? So if we delete that, if they come this way through here and he's alerted, then I can double click alerted, bam, there's the chest. We open it there it is without the scrolls right now you could do this any number of ways you could put a tile on the ground in front of the door that is an on enter and it does the same thing when the players enter it then it creates the chest right you could do it any number of ways i just wanted to make sure i had pretty good control over it happening um so that there would be no surprises <laughs> no pun intended right um, but yeah, so that really does the end of, um, red brand hideout, except for the letter from the spider, which I don't know that I created that, which is, um, which is surprising, but I think I did not create that. So I need to just create it, but I, all I will do is I will make it an item pile. I will um, make it look like a little piece of paper and I'll put it on this desk and I will probably, um, instead of doing like what we did with the journal um, or this book, because this book was in Dwarvish, I need it to be Dwarvish, so I need the journal functionality. With this, I'll probably just leave it an item and the contents of the letter will be in the description of the item, right? So if I, like, if I, go, to my, if I go to my items, and let's, if we look at the paradox, right? So this is an item. This will be the body of the letter um, will be in this description. So that's good. So that's, that's how I'll build that. And that's, you know, it's, again, that's very simple. We'll just create an item. Um, it'll be a loot item. Um, it'll be like a mysterious letter, right? And then and from there, it's just all about, uh, you know, picking some images up and then copying and pasting the text. Right, this stuff, copy, copy this, and we'll come in here and we'll just we'll paste it. Right, so when they pick up the letter, that's, that's it. And I do a lot of that in my game, right? Like just because, um, just because we're in a VTT doesn't mean we can't have handouts. Just because we're in a VTT doesn't mean that I should point out everything to you. Um, like a lot of times I'll omit checks for things unless it's super important, um, for finding like books, right? Like if they come in and they search this room, they're going to either find the book or they're not going to find the book. One of the two things, I'm not going to ask them to make me a role 
to see if they find it, they're just going to find it or they're not. And it depends on if they're paying attention. Um, Cause I mean, look, I do a lot already. Like see the cursor changes when you go over the item pile. And of course, because it's a token, I use image hover and down in the bottom corner of my screen, you can see that the image of the book pops up. So there's enough visual cues that I don't feel bad for doing it that way. Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And um, that's been Red Brand Hideout part two. Um, so anyway, uh, coming up next, next week's video is going to be uh, Curse of Strahd. Um, we're going to be talking about Curse of Strahd. I'm not real sure yet if I'm going to do um, the prep for where I'm at in my game um, because my game is quite far along. Um, my players are Cresc Abbey area. Uh, so I'm currently up in the air as to whether I want to do what I'm doing to prep my game. Do I want to do how would I set the game up from the beginning um, if I were setting the game up from the beginning because I use Benio's Battle Maps for my Ravenloft and I use some of uh, Pyram King's uh, Legends of Barovia stuff. And of course I use Rules as Written stuff along with maybe a little smattering of Mandy Mod and Dragna Carta stuff. But anyway, if you have uh, any preference, if you guys would like to see something specific as it relates to Curse of Strahd, uh, give your opinion down in the down in the doobly doo down there, and I will take it into consideration. But until I decide, I won't know. So if you like this video, if you found it useful, guys, give me a big thumbs up. Uh, consider subscribing. If you'd like to see more videos like this, um, I tend to, I want to do more like this. This is fun to me. I really enjoy uh, trying to come up with ways to make the books come alive inside of the VTT in a nice blend of theater of the mind and, um, and modules. So again, um, you all have a great day and I will see you on the next one. Peace.